So welcome everyone. Welcome to our, uh, what is it, sixth DNI uh, in the workplace uh, panel discussion, uh, which is organized by Diversify and Her Space. Uh, for many of you who, was, who are following us each month know that we started with these panel discussions in December uh, 2020. So it's been a while and we covered many, many topics until now. And as I said, we are posting each Monday uh, uh, audio recording as a podcast of, of DNI uh, panel discussion, previous DNI panel discussion. So if you want to catch up, please, uh, please do every Monday. So um, June is LGBTQIA plus Pride Month. So our panel discussion will also cover the same topic but in the context of workplace inclusion. Uh, and you know that we always cover uh, uh, topics that are relevant at the time that we, uh, in the month or at the time that we are uh, doing the panel discussion. So Pride Month is celebrated each June to honor the 1969 Stonewall uprising in Manhattan, which also started a gay liberation movement in the US. And since then, the, the Gay Pride Parade co commemorates that uprising, and uh, uh, June is also the month where, uh, besides the Gay Pride Parade, there is a lot of events uh, going on around the world. So, uh, just to introduce myself now, uh, I am. My name is Eva. Uh, I work for Diversify. Uh, I will be your moderator, and for uh, the members of our audience that might have visual impairment, I will also describe myself. Uh, I am a, a light-skinned, white, Caucasian woman with uh, long, light hair, uh, brown eyes. Uh, I am wearing a dark jacket and a white shirt, and my background is uh, kind of orange, brownish. Um, Okay, now I would like to also say hi and welcome our, uh, our speakers at the panel. And I will also invite them to introduce themselves and describe themselves. Uh, Hannah, can you start? Yes, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. My name is Hannah. Uh, I, um, I use pronouns she, her, and I'm... Uh, queer cisgendered woman from Norway. Uh, I'm white skinned, I'm, uh, my hair is brown, uh, drawn to the back. I'm wearing a white t-shirt and my favorite shirt and my favorite color, which is purple. Um, and my background is red pinkish. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you, Hannah. Uh, Chi, can you continue? Hi everyone, good afternoon to those who are overseas and good morning if anyone's on my side of this world. But um, I am East Asian and I have long brown hair. My pronouns are they, them. I identify as non-binary but androgynous. And so that's another topic that we'll probably be diving deeper into. Uh, I have a white scarf on and behind me is a window. I set myself up for a, a descriptive task I'm not sure I'm prepared for, but behind me is a pattern blanket and some uh, decorum that is floating above my head. So hopefully that helps. Okay, thank you, Chi and Chisum, of course. Hi everyone, my name is Chisum Udeze. Uh, my pronouns are she, ha. Um, I am a black woman, uh, identify primarily as Nigerian. Uh, I have a whitish beret on and I have black curly hair that I've pulled back today. I am wearing a white t-shirt and a blue, uh, what do you call it, green jacket. jacket. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the wall behind me is always uh, just uh, off whitish and it makes it really easy for me to describe. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I covered everything. So happy to be here and to uh, listen to and learn from Bucci and Hannah. Thank you all. I would also like you, if you can briefly introduce them yourselves uh, uh, 
like what do you do what is your uh, uh background just so audience knows a little bit more about you i know we promoted you a lot so whoever wrote uh, whoever read uh, about you know you but just for the ones who 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 would like to so yes hannah can you start also yes okay so um Today, I work as a project manager in a consulting firm called VR Us. Uh, directly translated, it's We Are Us, and that sounds like a kid's store, but it's really a um, consulting firm working on diversity directed towards the communication industry. And so we're working against underrepresentation, for example, and uh, participating in campaigns and making sure that people are seen and heard and actually. Um, that the whole population of Norway and also other countries are um, feel that they are seen and represented. That's just a short description. And uh, my background is I have a bachelor's degree in social anthropology and a master's degree in diversity and equality. So I wrote my thesis on transgender people and sexual health. Um, my Two big uh, things that I'm really um, fighting for are uh, queer rights or LGBTQI plus rights and also mental health. So I have a podcast about mental health. Um, I started uh, and, and ran um, a chat service for young adults in the Youth Mental Health Norway organization. Um, and I've been the head of uh, Trondheim Pride, which is the third uh, biggest pride in Norway. Which I and I learned a lot from that. Mm, yes. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. Oh, so you. we'll move on to Chi. Um, I am a I'm the resident carpenter for the Brooklyn Museum, and it's been a couple of years now working there. Prior to that, I was a freelance consultant for a design built uh boutique studio dealing with uh, displays and set designs and mainly in the mainstream fashion industry and I'm also a practicing artist uh, that is where my training comes from I am trained in sculpture and painting and drawing the classics um, and then I got that's where I got my undergrad and now I am just recently completed my graduate studies and museum studies and focused, uh, like Hannah, in terms of my thesis, was focused on diversity, inclusion, equ equity, and accessibility. And it is to do with the politics of it. It's more of a theoretical underpinning of how we can strategically plan practicality for the implementations. But also, um, so recently, I'm also part of multiple DEI committees. One is within the museum that I work in, trying to advocate for safe spaces. Uh, which is specifically uh, gender neutral bathrooms. That's mm -hmm. one, that's a priority. And for me in particular, uh, because it has affected my life in very specific ways over time. So that's what I'm currently working on. Thank you, Shi. Chisong? Um, yes, so I am uh, an economist. Um, and I am also a DEI strategist and enthusiast. Um, I work uh, within this space through different uh, angles uh, uh, to create opportunities for people of minority backgrounds. Um, I also actively try to use my voice to speak truth to power. Um, I address uh, or I approach most conversations uh, uh, around DEI from an intersectionality perspective, just looking at who is included, who's in the room, who's often left out, and seeing how we could, you know, include them. Um, and I, I love to learn and engage with these conversations, and uh, it's often, you know, not always comfortable, but it's necessary. Uh, uh, so I am a lifelong DEI learner and enthusiast. Thank you, Chisholm. Thank you all. Uh, I think it's time to start with the questions and, and, and start the conversation. I'm really looking forward to, to it. Um, and of course, again, I'm going to invite all of uh, 
all of our audience to leave comments, engage in the conversation uh, on chat. So chat is the platform where you can uh, say any comments, any thoughts, please share it with us. And of course, uh, we would love to hear your questions. Okay, so again, we're going to start with Hannah. Uh, so let's start with a little bit uh, of an introduction to the LGBTQIA community. What is the history of the LGBTQIA community in Norway? And how is it organized today? And what does it mean to you? Yes, okay. So um, the, the, like the, the big things on the history of the LGBTQI plus community, which I'm probably going to call the queer community in Norway for the rest of the session, um, is uh, it started somehow with a woman called Kim Frile. She's a very, very important role in the history of the queer community in Norway. Um, she was the first person to publicly represent what was then called as the, uh, the, the, the Norwegian Federation of 1948. So it didn't really, the title of the Federation didn't say anything about it working for queer people's rights. Um, and this was in the 1950s. Uh, and so that organization or that federation with time uh, went like became what is today known as free uh, and that's like a federation for sexual and gender gender um, diversity yes and then out from that organization uh, other organizations sprung out sort as such as uh, queer world which works specifically on queer people with ethnic minority. Uh, Hannah, you, you accidentally muted yourself. Okay, I'll try once more. Um, okay, I don't know where I was, but okay. So there are different organizations that has sprung out from the main one, um, focusing more um, specifically on either like ethnic minorities or Muslim, queer Muslims, for example. And today, like this year in 2022, it's 50 years since the law that criminalized sex between men was um, removed. Female, like women weren't even mentioned uh, because they didn't have a sexuality at that time, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so, and it's also 40 years in Norway since uh, like being gay stopped being a medical disease, like a disorder. Um, I also think that it's important to see like, because up until today, many things have changed and gotten better in Norway. But the reason for quite a few years, the, and also it's happening internationally, but the, the trans politics and the gender identity discussion is actually getting in many ways worse in Norway as well. Uh, and one of the big discussions in Norway uh, is about the institution that has monopoly on treating um, transgender people. And that's also a very central part of the queer community today. Um, and that's a really long story. So I'm not gonna go into the details. Um, so yeah, there are many different big and small organizations and communities within the community working for um, different things, I guess, uh, in a way, or for different groups. To me, the queer community um, is actually, I have mixed feelings when it comes to the queer community because it's, it's in one way, it's a safe zone. Uh, and in another way, it's also, it's both like fun, but it's also a struggle. It's um, having to, so like I've sometimes, um, I've been a part of it and then I had to take a break from the whole community because it's uh, there, we're gonna talk more about it probably today, but there are a lot of different discussions going on in the community. And also sometimes you get really worn out by being active in the community because it's all, like fighting, fighting, fighting. And it's um, sometimes your soul just can't take it. So I guess that's also a very important part of my um, relationship to the queer community, I guess. But the headline is, I love it. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you, Hannah. 
Um, so Chi, uh, I would uh, like to ask you a similar question. What does LGBTQIA community plus community mean to you? And where are some opportunities and challenges therein? Um, I think like Hannah, I feel the same about the, for me, the LGBTQ community, it's, it's a beautiful struggle. Um, it's that dialectic um, consistently. And I mean, I will even quote like our pop singer Pink who used the phrasing beautiful trauma, right? How can trauma possibly be beautiful? But every time we come out and every time we come through, there's something different for us and for the person who's engaging this. And that's the beauty of that dialogue. And so for me, the LGBTQIA plus community means that sort of dialectic to me. And uh, as far as opportunities and challenges, um, I think of late, and I will say that it's, it's messy, the community is messy, but I'm, I'm willing to live with this mess. And, um, and, the and the struggles and the challenges are how, how do we create visibility for all? And I think a lot of times we, more often than I would like to believe, we forget that there is nuance within the community that we're not addressing and we're not looking at. And even as we describe it in the heteronormative sense of race and gender and sexuality within the community itself, those variations and, those, and all those differences in the spectrum are sometimes not talked about and not described adequately, or they're still yet to develop language to describe it. And I think that's where the opportunity lies. How can we start creating the language to educate so that we can expand how we see the community as a whole, but not in a monolithic sense? And I, so one of those, so one of the things like, for instance, challenges is how do we even start talking about pronouns? And I think it goes both ways. I'm not going to be dogmatic. This is not going to church and I'm not gonna punish you for missing my pronoun at its immediacy. But by the same token, I will correct you, but I need to understand where does that conversation situate? Is it a deliberate intent and out of malice that you are dead naming me or misgendering me? Or is it a genuine mistake that we need further education and practice to develop the habit for? So I think those are those would be the things I would see as challenges and opportunities that's working simultaneously. And that's also how the community as a whole feels to me is this constantly beautiful struggle. And the coming out process, it's cyclical. And each juncture of my life, I'm coming out again, but differently, perhaps. Thank you, Chi. Very, very interesting. Um, okay, Chi Song. Uh, you do not identify as a member of the LGBTQIA plus community. Nonetheless, you consider yourself an active and evolving ally. Why is inclusion of people within the community important to you? And what are some challenges you see from the outside looking in? Um, thanks a lot, Eva, for the question. Um, I should just say, I hope you're not hearing the buzzing outside because, of course, right now somebody decided to cut some trees. Um, so hopefully it's not, you don't hear a lot of it. Um, it's uh, okay. I want to say that, uh, 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 yes, uh, as Eva said, I am a straight woman who does not identify as an, uh, a member of the uh, community. And I also wanna say that I have been engaging in a lot of conversations uh, as early as yesterday uh, 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 on LGBTQ community. And I also wanna to use today to listen and give space. So I'm gonna to try to talk as little as possible. Uh, but to answer Eva's question, I think that for me, uh, uh, Inclusion, of course, is, is, is important because it validates our individual uh, and collective experiences. Uh, uh, inclusion uh, within the community is very important for me because it also, uh, uh, um, how do you say it? it? It basically validates that you see people as they are. Uh, from the outside looking in, it appears to me that the majority groups, in this case, cisgendered white people are relatively more celebrated and visibilized uh, in comparison to minority groups within the community. 
I have seen the validity and contributions of people of color, trans people, people with disability, and more erased within the community. I see events that center uh, uh, LGBTQI a plus community and diversity and inclusion, but only white people and often cis straight people are centered. I see companies being performative allies on the importance of pride and the LGBTQ community without actually committing to any concrete change. Uh, I see companies being all about pride and the community in June, but the other 11 months of the year, they do nothing. You know, I see inclusion within the community clearly imitating what happens outside of the community. Uh, inclusion cannot only work for the majority. It is not inclusion if it only works for 96% of people. Yesterday, I heard a woman, uh, Osa from uh, uh, Nodea, she said, inclusion is not a democracy. And I absolutely wholeheartedly agree. You know, inclusion is not for the majority. It should work for the hundred percent, and this is why it matters to me. Thank you, Chisong. Uh, we can we can hear your passion. So, <laughs> um, okay, I will continue with the questions because we have a lot to cover, and I really want to cover everything. So, Hannah, oftentimes the LGBTQIA community is seen as a group. Is this an accurate perception of the people within the community? Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> I don't think so. It's, uh, I actually, when I started working with Trondheim Pride, I, uh, looking back, I realized that I was really, really naive entering the queer community in Trondheim because I was so excited that I'm going to be, I was just thinking that I'm going to be a part of this huge family that's just, they're working for everything. They're on the same path. Everyone is on the same team. Um, and then I realized that everyone is in a way actually on the same path and they're working for basic rights and acknowledgement and recognition um, that they don't necessarily agree on what that is all about. And that's also a reason why, um, I think at least, why all the letters, like why there's been becoming more and more letters in the LGBTQI plus term. Um, previously it was LGBT and now like more letters are being added. That in itself, it's not a problem, but it's also um, a result I think of different subgroups within the community fighting for their uh, identity to be seen and to be heard, such as um, bisexuals and pansexuals, for example. There's a very good reason why there's a whole like organization in itself called Bivisible, because many gay people have uh, or other people have this understanding of a bisexual person that you're just you just haven't decided yet, and that's really um, taking away their identity and the way of them to um, define themselves. So that's also a so people are kind of fighting, but they're all fighting for the same. They're fighting to be seen and to be heard. Um, so I think that's uh, the reason why my answer would be no. Yeah. <laughs> And I have to say, can I just say mm -hmm. quickly um, about the community as well? One of the most important parts of the community is to also see other people living lives that look like your own in a way that you don't see in the outside world. I think that's also like, I forgot to tell you earlier and I just realized that that's a really important and central part of the, of the queer community. Mm. Mm. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Uh, Chi. Mm, gender representation or expression is still very much stereotyped and limited to masculine and feminine. Can you expand our understanding on gender presentation and how heteronormative standards affect people within and outside the community? Uh, um, that's, that's a very loaded question. I'm going to do my best because by no means am I a scholar on the topic, but I have, uh, I have done some research and study as per my own practice. 
Um, gender presentation expression uh, is still very binary. It still falls into this duality. And I think it creates a false sense of value. Um, and even within the community, if you are straight acting, straight passing, for instance, uh, which is considered cisgender heteronormative behavior, and let's attach that to uh, race ethnicity, you, are, you have currency that's different than mine. And so if you, and you are then valued differently and with that value allows you to move through space differently. And I think that it's, um, that's a mistake. And I think for myself, um, I use the phrase non-binary, uh, which is very different than transgender and androgyny. Androgyny is an immutable uh, quality, just like blackness is an immutable quality. My Asianness is an immutable quality. Non-binary still falls within the presentation, which is if I am cisgender heteronormative and straight passing, but yet I, I present myself opposite or in dialectics to what I identify with, that's non-binary, which is not immutable per se. Um, so I think that when we fall into the same sort of molds of masculine and feminine, we are devaluing other people and we're taking away who they are and what they may represent and what they can bring to the table to inform us. Because for instance, I'm a carpenter, but yet as someone that's androgynous and depending on when and where I may or may not pass, it becomes an issue because, and that issue is this idea of deception that if you pass, then you enter the next levels of our social hierarchy. But if you don't, then too bad for you. And I think that's also applicable to race and how that plays into it, in addition to sexuality and gender normative um, stereotypes. So I think that's something that I'm, I'm very interested in because I don't think gender or sexuality is always so concrete and it's very fluid. Um, because there are days where I may want to show up in my heels and there, there's just days that I just want to show up in my chaps. And that's my prerogative to make that decision, no matter how immutable and no matter how my identity cannot be erased as I stand forward. And I think we have to see that, which goes back to what Hannah said, we have to be able to see it in order to understand and then hear it and understand how to move with it and navigate with it, which then brings back to what Chisholm said. I'm not just this one thing, one month, one day, everything, all the time, every day. So how do we move with all of that? Wow, yes, absolutely. It's just so important um, to even hear that, know that, and think about that. Uh, uh, so thank you so much, Chi, for sharing this. And I hope people in the audience are, are making notes and, and uh, you know, thinking up of, of comments and, and what they want to share, because we would really like to hear from you too. Uh, okay, so Chisom, we'll talk a little bit about intersectionality in, in this next few questions, uh, which is a very, very uh, also important topic to, to, to know and to think about and to have in mind. Uh, so within the Chisong, within the LGBTQIA community, cisgendered men and women, and often those who identify as white are still largely the most accepted groups within and outside the community, as both Chi and Hannah mentioned that. Uh, many types of isms still exist within the community. What is the relevance of intersectionality to inclusion within the LGBTQIA plus community? Thanks, Eva. I'm just gonna quick do a quick definition of intersectionality and I'm smiling because I feel like I talk, I say the same definition all the time because I talk about it so much. But intersectionality is an analytical framework that was uh, coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw to basically map out how our various identities uh, come together to uh, 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 mandate our experience of the world through layers of privilege and ladders. Yes, you can think that everybody is intersectional, you know, but depending on uh, 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 the identities that you carry, you might experience more discrimination than privilege. So just kind of, uh, and this this happens on the basis of you know diversity variables like race, gender, ethnicity, religion. 
identity and things of this nature. So to your question, uh, 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 it was what is the relevance of intersectionality and inclusion within the queer community? Uh, 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 and to keep this as briefly as I can, I think if you don't see people intentionally, you will all intentionally erase them, right? If you don't see me, you're erasing me by choice in some way, whether it's in your subconscious or it's in your conscious. It is, uh, and I thought about this yesterday, that it is an absolute privilege to walk into a room and not see anyone. I don't have that privilege. Many people within minority groups don't get to walk into a room and be like, oh, I can't see anyone. People are just people, you know, because oftentimes I walk into a room and I see who's not there. So for example, I think perhaps some of you here, some of us have said we don't see color or we've heard people say they don't see color. When you don't see color, when you see people as people, I know it's supposed to mean well and it's saying that you treat everyone the same. But when you feel comfortable sitting in a room filled with the majority and you're discussing something like diversity and inclusion or LGBTQ community within Pride Month, and you don't even have the thought of, oh, this room could be more diverse. It doesn't cross your mind, even after engaging with diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. I'm just going to say this loud and clear. You're being complicit. You are enabling and benefiting from the systems and structures that continue to erase people who do not fit into a heteronormative expectation intersectionality, equity, inclusion, they go hand in hand. And this lens mandates granular acts of intention. You know, you need to ask who's not here, who's not included, who's who needs to be here within the community and outside of the community, even for simple things as planning an event. So just a quick example, uh, in August, we're planning this you know, conference on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and in looking for speakers for it, we, my team and I literally sat down and went, okay, we have enough black people, we need brown people, we need white people, we need Asians. You have to be intentional to the granular because otherwise you will continue to erase people, you will continue to ignore people. And that is not okay uh, at this point after having a lot of this conversation. It's just, it's upsetting, it's overwhelming and you're being complicit. So there goes that. Oh, thank you Chisholm. And, and yes, being intentional for us from the majority group that have this uh, uh, majority parameters is so important because otherwise it's just, yeah, as you said, people get erased because we don't even think about it. Um, thank you, Chizon. So Chi, I will, I will uh, continue with you. A few months ago, uh, you joined us on a panel discussion where we discussed uh, racial equity. And uh, Chisholm just uh, further nuanced intersectionality. So my question is, how does race interact with gender and sexuality on a basis of inclusion? Um, it's, it's super important. I think we have, um, as Per Chisholm said, uh, we sometimes mm -hmm. see the community, as Hannah said, I'm also gonna uh, simplify it, the queer community um, as this monolith, as this collective that is based on a sexual uh, identity and not seeing the gender or the race that plays into it. And we all have stereotypes of who may represent what and who may do what behind closed doors. And those are not adequate ways of seeing individuals. And I think that when, for instance, I'm East Asian, I am androgynous, center femme, but my job is hypermasculine and circulates within a heteronormative cisgender male arena. So I'm a living contradiction. I'm happy to live these contradictions, but people may not see that and people may respond very differently. I don't fit the mold of the heteronormative cisgender men that does these carpentry work. People may not respond to me appropriately and may see me differently. And compounding that, that particular industry is filled with a binary, which is usually, um, in, I can only speak of New York. I can't speak about other spaces, but in New York, the construction and the carpentry fields mainly made up of straight men that are um, black or white. And the black men came about through the automotive industry when a lot of things became automated in that particular industry, they sort of migrated to the construction industry. And so my presence 
disrupts all of that. So when, so in addition to the race issue is my gender presentation. And I think that is universal, even within the community. And I'm gonna go bring it back to the community where if you are black or Asian or brown, you have a different value system. The system has created a hierarchy. And as we know, there's been debates about apps when people can anonymously say, um, and I'm, it's, sometimes it's hard and uncomfortable to hear this, but on the apps, they will put no fans, no fats, no fags, no blacks, no rice, no beans. Using that sort of symbolic language is implicitly derogatory. And that is saying that that's our identity flattened but we're more than that identity. So when we don't think about the race, my race is not attached to what I eat. It's beyond that. And I also don't represent my entire race. I, I may not like other Asians for that matter. And so to assume that would be a flawed reasoning. And so, and also when our race is defined by stereotypes of, so Asians in this country are exoticized and femi feminized while Black and brown are hypersexualized, exoticized, and fetishized differently. So within the gay community, that still plays out. It's not disconnected. It's interrelated, where our race and our gender presentation defines our sexual preferences, quote unquote, and also how people perceive our positioning within that community. Thank you, Chi. Oh. That is so important. And, and I've seen that uh, there are many people uh, uh, joining us uh, a little bit late. So uh, I would like to also call every, every one of you who join us a little bit late to leave your comments, share your thoughts uh, uh, on what is going on, and of course, ask us questions. Uh, okay, so let's move on. Mm, so, uh, Hannah, uh, you are an, as, as you said, you're an active member of the LGBTQIA plus community in Norway. You have led pride in Trondheim. So my questions are, is there racism and other forms of discrimination within the community in Norway? And if yes, which groups are most affected and what needs to be done to mitigate, address the challenges faced? Okay, I'll try to answer that as good as I can. Uh, well, unfortunately, um, yes, there is racism in the queer community. Um, I said it earlier as well, I'm going to simplify it and call it the queer community. Um, in Norway as well, um, there is, uh, I've read quite a few interviews, because um, like, I, I haven't felt racism myself, right, but I've read all about it and it's um what a few um queer people with like uh, ethnic minority um backgrounds say is that it does it's not necessarily more racism within the community than it is outside but it creates its own um sense of feeling because you're you're, you have an expectation of the community being your safe space. The community is your people and they're on your side. And then having, being met with racist comments or events or uh, like being forgotten or discriminized um, because of your, the color of your skin, for example, uh, feels even worse when it comes from your own people. Um, and it's definitely happening in Norway as well. I know it's been a discussion for, for many years, uh, like directed towards the national organization in Norway fighting for, for queer rights, because they don't have, it's, it's a very white organization. And, and that shows in their events. And also, uh, obviously, like in people then feeling and experiencing being forgotten and discriminated based on their um, ethnicity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but there are other types of discrimination as well, and one of them I've already talked about, but I think it's a very central part, like one of the bigger groups that are discriminated within the community, um, which is transgender people. And I, uh, the way I see, like many 
Prejudice comes from lack of knowledge, no matter where it comes from. And that's also an issue within the community. Like it's easy to take for granted in a way that people within the queer community, they know everything about being queer in every single variation of it. But we don't, you know, none of us know. I don't know what it feels like to be transgender, for example, but I can take responsibility and I can read about it and I can be curious, but curious in the right way as well. Um, use my brain. <laughs> If that's, yeah, if that makes sense. But so my point is that um, one of the things that I saw um, creating Trondheim Pride was that we were going to create this safe space event for um, like expanding it from being like a traditional women's night only to being more inclusive, being for all women and non-binary people. And the response that we got from that was mostly good but also surprising from some groups. For example, uh, some like cisgendered lesbian women who felt that this was, they were taking away their only event that was for them. And they're being transphobic, some of these people, because they don't want transgender like women to be a part of, um, like to call themselves women. Um, and the same thing is actually happening also among uh, the trans community, because the trans community is also divided in different understandings of gender identity. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, some transgender people are very binary in their understanding, so they don't want to include non-binary people. Um, yeah, and there are many different examples as well. I, uh, when I started in Trondheim Pride, I also got like a comment. I remember it very well because I I got a comment from another person leading another quite big pride uh, who said to me that you don't look gay enough to be the head of a pride. So that's also an issue. Um, yeah. So I, ha I have more examples, but th those are a few of them. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so interesting to hear all of that because I mean, gay enough, what does that? <laughs> What does that even mean, right? But but you know, hearing hearing this in um, internal discrimination, it it just looks like the outside world. Just like Chisholm said, you know, it's like a like a mirror of everything that is that is also happening outside. And ah, uh, yes, that's why these conversations are so important, and learning is so important because, as you said. Like, for instance, I can never know how it is to be a gay person, a black person, but I can learn, I can ask questions, I can talk. And, and although it, it will never be a uh, hundred uh, percent, you know, I will never walk in anybody else's shoes, but mine, but I can, I can understand more and, and it leads to more understanding and acceptance. Um, so th thank you, Hannah. And, um, Yes, I will continue with Chi. Uh, how does power structures play out within the community? And what does trading up means within this context? And what does proximity to whiteness factor into that equation? Wow, thank you for that. Um, I Let me just start by actually circling back to the earlier. I feel like I missed part of your question earlier about inclusion and race and intersectionality. Of course. Of course. Um, I, I think that because race is inextricably attached to our gender and sexuality based on stereotypes and value, oftentimes we're excluded or self-segregated, if that makes sense. So we kind of fall into these groups where we have white people hang out in one space, black people hang out in one space, Asian people hang out in one space, and they have to self-segregate in order to feel that they're included within their own community or transgender people congregate where. And so that, so in terms of how it applies to inclusion, it actually functions um, in this sort of self-segregated way, if that makes sense when it comes to race and how that it works in terms of inclusion within the community. But moving to your current question, yes, and I agree with Chisholm, it is a huge question because it is um, trading up is not just a idea that's related to the queer community, it's universal. And I think that, um, and it's 
a flawed reasoning to assume that we can trade up because I'm still going to be me no matter who I may be with in proxy to. And so with that said, there are real cemented power structures within the queer community. There is uh, cisgender heteronormative uh, men and women that are white. So if you can act straight or pass as straight, you have a different value, especially if you're white. Um, or even in the transgender community, if you can pass as a man or a woman and you're white, you have greater currency. So we can even look at it in our, link, our uh, pop culture where we have Caitlyn Jenner, where we have um, Elliot Page, but there's still white representations of an entire community that's not that. And I know that from personal experience as someone that has been um, identified by not myself singularly, but by others as being androgynous, I've been both perceived as privileged, but also disenfranchised. So privilege in a sense that depending on how I move through space, I can pass. To the transgender community, I am privileged because I don't have to go through their transformation process to pass. That in itself is privilege, but they negate, negated the fact that my race partakes in that. That my race puts me in, in the bottom half of that hierarchy and that power structure. So in order for me to find a safe space perhaps, um, that power structure must be manipulated. And that is either collectively in solidarity or trading up. So becoming closer to where the power resides, the power resides in whiteness and those who can pass, then let me make sure that my partner is this white cis heteronormative person that I can be proxy to power for too so that I can feel safer. But I should also understand myself personally that my power comes from solidarity and collective grouping, not just simply by having one person protect and defend me because that doesn't make sense, right? We all have to do it for each other. And so I think, which also sort of echoes what Hannah was talking about and that the power structure is very established. There is the binaries, there is the race, and then there is um, compounding that is also socioeconomic. Who can afford to? who can afford to move through these spaces, who can afford to go through the entire transformation and fit the mold of how we perceive gender and sexuality. And not everyone does. And especially in this country, we don't have socialized self-care. So it's always like survival of the fittest. Who can find what to transition and transform? And then when that happens, do we forget about the rest of the community because now we fit in and now we can find ourselves in positions of power. And I think that sort of becomes very um, challenging. So, and so with proximity to whiteness, and as I've discussed earlier about the presentation in media, we still see that as the power, but that should not be. And, there, and we can see that that's slowly changing because people of color are coming together. And I think that that's a strong statement to be made. And you no, know, I'm of a different generation and because it's Pride Month, I've been sort of, you know, circulating through some parties and I'm seeing these young queer individuals coming together. In the past, you'll see Asian, Asian boys, like I need to date a white man because that's how I'm gonna actually fit into society in American Western society. If I'm not dating a white man and I'm gay, I'm not gonna fit in this society. But to my surprise now, that mentality is slowly changing. But and it's gonna be incremental. It's not gonna happen overnight, but it's good to see and know. And I think that's where um, I see now it's proxy to whiteness, that whiteness and the sense of power is still there, but it's perceived differently and it's treated differently that I no longer feel that I need to be that trophy for you. And you're not the person that's gonna save me from this space. Thank you for sharing this, Chi. It's, it's really good to hear that. <laughs> it's really good to hear that there are changes, you know, the younger generation, you know, generations are doing it. <laughs> um, okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about allyship, and of course, uh, we're going to start with Chisholm. Uh, so let's talk about allyship, Chisholm. Uh, what does allyship mean to you in general and within the context of the LGBTQIA plus community? 
And given your experience as a black woman in the world and a member of a number of minority groups, what have you learned about being an active ally? Um, good question. Um, <laughs> I think allyship, like to put it, you know, just in a summary, I, I, I think of it as showing up even when you have something to lose. It's easy to show up when you have nothing to lose. I think to be an active ally, and I, I shouldn't even have to put active in front of allyship because that should just already be like known that being an ally means you are actively in the fight. Uh, show up even when you have something to lose. Do it because it's right, not because it's the popular or comfortable thing to do. You know, it, it is affirming people's agency to be who they are, validating who they are. When somebody tells you, for example, that they are bisexual, don't ask them, oh, do you swing more my way or their way? I mean, how about just saying, hey, I believe you. Okay, let's drink a glass of wine and talk about other things, right? Uh, I think making yourself aware of the reality within the community and beyond. For example, and I think she, has nuanced this a bit, you know, Asian men in the queer community are largely considered feminine and passive. Black people are considered aggressive. Trans men especially, uh, experience violence and most especially when they are black or brown. 61% of black people within uh, the community say they experience racism. People of color, Latinx, Asian, brown, black people, you know, they are double minority. They, they are not accepted in the community. They are not accepted outside of the, uh, the community. And if all of this injustice, and you should get to know this injustice, because I think like when we're only listening to the cushy parts and like, yeah, we can celebrate pride. Yeah, we can get married. Like if we're not listening to the hard reality, you don't get angry and you don't get to act. And I think this injustice should make each and every one of us angry. And then we need to use that anger and channel it productively. We need to use it to speak truth to power. We need to use our voice or our action where we can. For people in Oslo, for example, you might know that in, uh, in March, during the Women's March, uh, trans women and non-binary people were excluded. Right, So the action of allyship is perhaps not to go to that women's march because it excludes women, right? So we cannot march for women liberation when we are actively choosing to exclude a group of women, right? So I think that it means when you walk into a room that is not diverse or inclusive and, that, and when you have the power to do so, to call it out. If you can't call it out actively, call it out in a joke, maybe send a message to the organizers. Um, I also find it interesting that even within the erroneous binary, like the men, women, like the man woman perspective, we often see rooms filled with men, often called out even by white women. But somehow rooms filled with both white men and white women, I don't hear a peep about it outside of from people of color. So for me, I'm also just finding it difficult to believe that people walk into a room and not see difference. Because if you walk into a room and see all men, you'd be like, oh my gosh, there's so many men in this room. Why can't we see it for other people as well? Why can't we see it for other groups? Why can't we see it for other identities and I think that for me so to the question of being a black woman and a minority group like it is so exhausting to continue to excuse the excuses it's 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 tiring it's it's just we have eyes and and I when you see people show up in other areas when it concerns them but then they don't show up in many other areas it's I just find that yeah, it's a bit disempowering and I can see why people also get exhausted because I get exhausted even just engaging. It's like, why even bother, right? Because oftentimes people who are celebrated as DEI champions are fitting into the same systems and structures. So I think a good way to be an ally is really just to listen and have the hard and uncomfortable conversations. If you're feeling uncomfortable, that's a really great place to start. Ask yourself, why do I feel this way? When you get the urge to defend yourself or your point of view, here's a valid tip. Shut up and listen. 
listen to the people's stories, listen and learn from, when, uh, from what they tell you and then use it in allyship. Ask people what they need and understand that people need different things. Because your one black friend or your one gay friend said something is okay, does not mean that another black person or another gay person thinks that would be okay. Oh, absolutely. I feel like I'm too angry for this conversation. <laughs> No, 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 but we, we do need, and you know, I have to share with the audience, you know, I've seen, I've heard Chisholm talk lately, and it's been very passionate. I mean, I think this anger, as you said, you are channeling it in a really good way. And I can, I can also share with people what, what other people who've been to Chisholm's talk have been telling me that they've been really shaken up. And I think this is, that's the point. That's why I think it's so important to, to, yeah, and I, I, I can't imagine, and I know that it's, it's exhausting for you. And that's why, you know, I think we all have to be so intentional, especially us from the majority groups. So listen, listen, people, learn and listen and, and be an active ally. Um, okay, where are we? <laughs> um, okay, so we will continue with Hannah. Uh, how can a heteronormative cisgendered person within the community use their power and privilege in allyship within the community? That's a good question. Um, I just remember that uh, recently I, or just recently I went to this conference um, and we were talking about role models and the importance of uh, in this situation, um, it was cisgendered, straight white men in important roles in businesses. Like, what kind of role model can they be for LGBTQI plus rights, for example? And we were having this conversation and talking about the importance of it. And then uh, one guy, he was uh, fitting into that category as well. He... Um, he had this great idea. He was just like, ah, I know the perfect guy. It's that one guy, the one gay guy at work. He can be that role model. Uh, he's white and gay, so he can do it. Uh, and that was really annoying and provoking. And then afterwards, uh, I think I have this um, thing that I, myself, I call it a genuine face. So if you say something that I don't like, you'll probably see it on my face right away. Uh, and I think he noticed. So afterwards, he wanted to talk to me one-on-one uh, -on -one, and he um, and he said like, uh, he was saying that, okay, so really me being here and at this conference, it doesn't have anything to do with me, you know? Cause you know, I'm not gay. So it doesn't have anything to do with me. And okay, so my, my son is gay. So in a way, I guess you could say it has to do with me, but not really. And that's, I think, that's just, that's just something I just remembered because I think that's, that's one of the reasons why cisgendered heteronormative people should be active allies and role models within their businesses and their families and their group of friends. Um, I'm actually thinking that like, that's also a kind of representation to be, for example, in this uh, example would be like a cisgendered, heteronormative, white male in an important role in a business who can, like, who's a proud and, and trustworthy ally who knows what he needs to know about the queer community and the queer people's rights, has an inclusive language, the effect of doing that is could be huge because I'm at least I'm imagining that other people that look like him would say would think like oh he looks exactly like me and he says those things like it is it's kind of the opposite of representation in a way yeah yeah that's my first thought <laughs> yes and, and and it's so true you know, when when a, a person that belongs to the majority actually speaks for any kind of minority group, it's 
unfortunately, you know, people will listen. Other people from majority will listen. Um, I just want to chime in to this uh, particular comment that Hannah made. I also want to caution because it's a great question. I think it's a great, it's a great sense of allyship. Um, because it is, like, you speak to not only in the presence of, but also when it's absent. And I think that's really important. But more importantly is that it goes back, well, Hannah's answer is so complicated because it goes back to what you asked me earlier, and that is the proximity to whiteness, which is defined as privilege. And if we still rely and resort to the quote unquote power structure to define us, then when do we define ourselves? And I think that becomes very, and that's when we, do we continuously have to trade up and be close to whiteness in order to feel that we are equal to and that we are enough, as Hannah said, like, what is this enough? When can we be enough? Do, does it mean that we constantly and consistently have to trade up in order to be enough within how the Western realm sees us? And I think that makes Hannah's um, answer so complex and, and, and demands active like participation as opposed to simply this theoretical like spewing of like how the structure works because it's beyond that because we can't gauge what happens in real life and what may be thrown at us at that moment. And so I think that's that's why I would caution how that can play out because it does very, it can very easily become the white savior because they fit the mold and now we have to continue this cycle of trading up again. And that and then it sort of wedges these individual groups of um, quote unquote minorities and we fight against each other to try to trade up and it's silly. <laughs> you know? I'll say something as well. Yeah, okay, because this also reminds me of the, uh, I think that's a really good point. And it's, I think um, this is also about like how majority groups tolerate other groups. And that like sh that really emphasizes the power uh, shift between different kinds of groups. And in a way, this could also end up being kind of like that. And like, I'm not going to be tolerated. It's going to be, I'm, I'm going to be myself and not like you don't have to allow me or tolerate me in order for me to to be who I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, G. Oh. Thank you for sharing, both of you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, but we need to move on with our questions. Um, now, Chisholm, uh, where does the workplace responsibility lie with regards to conversation on LGBTQIA plus experience and amplifying visibility for the group? Um, I think that workplace responsibility always lies with the leadership. Uh, they need to take a stand uh, because when the leadership takes a stand, people will generally follow. Um, so it lies with leadership and then with all the allies who don't belong in the community. So uh, for the straight, hetero, cis, gendered people, right? Um, so, you know, what can be done? Just simple tips. It's always important to center uh, people within the group, you know, ask their opinion, don't design something you think they like, include them in the design of those things. So take events, for example, and please don't have events that are supposed to send community and then have a bunch of straight people and one queer person as that token, right? You, just don't do it. Um, I think it's always important to, 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 to understand that you don't know what you don't know and that your passion, my anger for injustice does not give me uh, uh, the lived experience that somebody within the community has. So whenever possible, center them and it's always possible. So let me not even say whenever possible, it's always possible, center them. Um, I think I was having a chat about this with uh, Hannah yesterday because we had a conference together. And so since we're talking about from the workplace perspective, uh, uh, but yesterday and other times, I, I hear a lot of companies talk about how they are so proud of their 80% of people being happy or 60% of people being happy when you know they do a survey. And I'm just like, don't celebrate mediocrity as Astrid from Uda says. You know, don't celebrate exclusion. When 80% of your people are happy, this is a good place to start a conversation. What about that 20%? Who are they? 
right? Is the 80% from the majority group? And what about the 20%? Who are they? Because that is where inclusion lies. That is where you have an opportunity to actually create systems and structures that you know, supports the 100%. Inclusion is not inclusion if it only works for the majority. So I think, and I say this with love and compassion and also understanding that because uh, from, from a, a mathematical and data perspective was so uh, 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 um, biased to looking at the majority, you know, as I said, as I said, there is no democracy in inclusion, right? So even if you have 93% that are happy, good job, that 93% of people are happy, but you also have a responsibility to ensure that the other 7% are also happy. Yes, thank you, Chisong. We talked a lot about it uh, uh, yesterday and, and yeah, uh, there's a long way to go. I'm moving to Chi. Uh, so Chi, there is an emotional tax or burden of having to advocate for yourself self while continuously having to assert your identity. Can you expand on this and how it might cause harm to a person? Um, I think I'll do it in a, a perhaps a more intimate way and a more personal way because I don't want to speak for everyone else. But um, the idea of the burden and the emotional tax is having to relive certain triggering incidents in my life each time I have to assert my identity and define it. So for instance, um, having to advocate why and who I am should not even be a part of it because it's, I can't erase my Asian-ness. It is what it is. I cannot erase my androgyny. I am born this way. So for the fact that I have to advocate it, I'm reliving moments in my life that may have triggered negative feelings. And that in itself is trauma. So every time when you have to advocate for yourself, you may be triggering emotions and feelings that are negative and sometimes positive depending on your situation. But oftentimes that process will trigger, for me at least, negative feelings of what, what it meant for me to live as this person in this society that is dominated by a different set of rules that's been legislating me to death. And so I have to think about that. And it's, it, it's, this, re, it's this cycle of trauma until, but, as I had said before, it's also a beautiful trauma because now I know that I have lived it, I have survived it, and I'm okay sharing it. And I'm not afraid to share it because this is the truth and this is the honest to me. And so I think that's the part where I, I'm, it's, that trauma can become positive, but nonetheless, that reliving of those triggered moments can be emotionally taxed and burned and it's a, and it's a mental, mental health issue. But on top of all that is the fact that when you have to assert your identity, that means you're not being seen and you're not being heard. And if you advocate for it, then you are having to do the work that other people should be doing consistently. And so they're lacking their lazy, that's, it's laziness, right? When we talk about unconscious bias, like, and I know that we use that a lot, it's, it's exactly what Chisholm said, we're excusing excuses. There's nothing unconscious about bias. It's just not exercising rigorous thought because we have this knowledge of something and then we just take it for granted and not think before we speak or act sometimes. And to have to assert and advocate against an excuse, it's a lot of work. And, it's, and when it's identity-based, it's personal. It's not external to me. Even when in the workspace, even the workspace as a professional space is still personal space because I am existing in it. So, and, and that becomes that sort of emotional tax and burden because we have to relive that those moments that may be great, but oftentimes may not be. Thank you, Chi. And it's such a privilege to be lazy and, and not exercise that, that vigorous thought, as you said, and, and, you know, enjoying that space of being like, Buh. Um, and asking questions that are, are absolutely, um, yeah, not necessary actually. So thank you, Ching. And thank you for calling it laziness. It, it's not nice to hear it. It's really not nice to hear it, but it's, it's true. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on um, to Hannah. Uh, in a workplace setting, 
how can policy or strategy be used to better include folks in the LGBTQIA plus community? Well, I think it's been said once and twice and maybe three times already, knowledge, increased knowledge is the first thing to do and also to have it as a mandatory thing, like on a regular basis. Um, this, this is like important for many different um, uh, topics, like, you know, like racism, homophobia, transphobia, uh, but also the other way around, like the learn about how to talk about how to introduce yourself with the using your pronouns, for example, learn and practice inclusive language um, and use this actively, especially uh, in like the the first meeting when people meet your business for the first time on an interview on an or in an onboarding process, be very clear on where you stand. Because um, in the uh, like in one way, if people think that okay that's a bit much, then maybe that's not the right employer for your company. And if they are queer themselves, they will really appreciate it. And then it's the it's a good start of them thinking that, okay, this is probably maybe a safe place for me. Um, and all the, all the people in between, which will like not see it as a problem at all, but a very, very important initiative and a very important way of um, taking a stand, I think. And I also think like she was saying, be aware of mental health and increase your knowledge on mental health as well. And realize that the the queer community has in general the statistics on their mental health is a lot worse than the majority of the population and having that in mind when having employers um then you would probably also know that being part of a minority you get questions and you get um people asking about your identity all the time, even in the media or directly to you or on the bus or wherever. And this gets, this collects into this whole bomb inside potentially. And that's very important to know when you have people working for you, uh, also called microaggressions, I guess. Um, yeah, and I also think that you should, um, oh, I, I forgot what I was gonna say. Um, but yeah, I think uh, be be like I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back if I come back to like if it comes back to my mind. Yeah, no problem, Hannah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's been so many information shared <laughs> in this in this hour and fifteen minutes that that yeah I can I can imagine. But uh -huh. I remember I remember. Okay, because the thing is, I got I heard something yesterday which I thought was a really, really good um, thing that a company did. And so, and it rem like the heading, I guess, would be like to have action plans or safety nets for queer employers uh, or employees. Yeah, the people working there. Um, so uh, an, an example of this was that many transgender people have economical issues, personal issues, because they have to in Norway, for example, since the institution treating trans transgender people is very binary, many transgender people don't get surgery or uh, gender reassuring treatment through um, our state. Therefore, they have to pay for it themselves and they get really like they get into trouble for that. So this business, they uh, ensure paid leave for transgender people who has to go abroad to do gender reassuring surgery. And I think that's just a brilliant example of seeing your um, people's uh, struggles and the reality of this is an obligation, like this is something you have to do. If it feels right for you, you have to do it. You have to you spend the time and spend the money in order to be yourself the way you feel is right. And another example would be maybe uh, creating families through surrogacy, have some sort of support system for that. So that's also, I think, um, something that workplaces can do in terms of strategy or policy. Um, 
really concrete instead of just using the big words that Chisholm was talking about. <laughs> okay, I'm really happy I remembered it. Okay. Oh, thank you, Hannah. We're also happy you remembered it because this was <laughs> this was really chi. I see you um, unmuted yeah. yourself. Do you want to add? I do because Hannah, thank you for raising that. Mental health is so important, and I think that it's not just about um, the the trauma that I was talking about, but also depression. Can they get out of bed? Can they get out of their house when? the time it may take them to be prepared and the time it takes, like for instance, um, taking away the gender sexuality part, just as living as a person that is that has immutable qualities. I have to think about how do I present myself when I get out of bed and leave my door to avoid everything that I may encounter that day. And that brings about self-doubt. It brings about insecurities. It brings about um ideas of what that um what violences i may be interacting with and coming across and all of that can create a really oppressive setting an oppressive environment where depression then leads to real instability in our mental health and there's not enough um work that's being done to help it i feel in the sense that there's i don't know what it's like um globally but i know in the US, we don't have socialized health care. And as a matter of fact, mental health is treated as like some luxury if we have like, oh, you have mental health and you need to see a shrink. That's your luxury. That's not my issue. But there's no luxury in someone having a mental breakdown. There's no luxury in someone not being able to leave their home and participate in society normally. So I just wanted to add that to what Hannah was speaking to about mental health. If I may, um, Eva. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, uh, and, and just piggybacking off what uh, both Hannah and she said, you know, uh, uh, and just to bring an intersectional lens to it, I think that oftentimes people of color, people of minority groups, every time you leave the door, you, you, you have to prepare yourself for the world outside. Uh, I, I have to do it all the time. I, I reckon maybe Chi has to do the same, even just on the basis of, you know, I'm not even in the community. Now imagine for people who are also within that community where they not only have to prepare for being Asian or brown or black, they also have to prepare for being gay or trans or non-binary. It's, I mean, it's so, even trying to imagine it is so heartbreaking because I know just how hard it is to be a black person in this world and leave my house every single day. You know, it's just like we had the, you know, bulletproofs and armors and like invisible policemen and bodyguards. Like you prepare yourself because you don't know what will happen. And it's not about being a, a pessimist, you know, like preparing for the worst to happen. This is just like a statement of fact. And it's better, you know, you can, you, you're better prepared to receive microaggressions or unconscious bias when you know you're, you're mentally even though subconsciously prepared for it so i i, I can't even imagine uh, uh, uh just the compounding layers of disadvantage that you know people within the community have and especially when they are from minority groups just wanted to say that and the consequences that all of that can have on your body on your health like just physically you know, it's unbelievable. It's just, I, I was also, when, when, when you were saying, I was trying to imagine if, if I had to prepare for that every day, what kind of a burden that would be emotionally and physically. Oh my God. Um, I make okay. a joke about that. Sorry, I just want to, I make a joke about that. And that is, you know, if I'm having a bad day, I'm going to have cake and some champagne. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, I, I, if I could say one more thing, Eva, I, I also want to say that I also know what it feels like to not have to worry when I leave my door, usually when I'm in some African continent, like country, when I'm in Nigeria, and, and I see the difference, just like, oh, so this is what white people feel like. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and I know the difference. And I, so I also have that privilege when I'm, say, in a majority, say, black or brown country. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Chisong, what are your thoughts around workplace disclosure 
and is it necessary to bring your full self to work? Uh, I, 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 I mean, that's why we're having these conversations because we want people to be able to bring all of themselves to work. And, you know, I'm encouraged by stories you know, I hear where people, regardless of their, you know, different identities, even within the community, uh, are able to show up as they are. So, for example, Miriam uh, 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 from Super Seria, uh, she has a wonderful story of just like acceptance within uh, uh, um, her workplace. And I think that's absolutely beautiful. And that is the dream. Um, uh, unfortunately, a lot of companies are not there yet, and it can be quite harmful uh, for people to disclose. I think uh, 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 if companies create a safe space uh, where people truly valued as they are, people might just naturally feel like, okay, yeah, I can be myself and it doesn't matter. But if that safe space is not created and is not available, then people should definitely, I don't think there should be anywhere in a policy book anywhere that people must disclose because they don't owe you that part of who they are. It is their, you know, it, it, it's their identity to disclose when they want or not. And I think we also have to respect that. And instead, I think the focus needs to be on creating a truly inclusive and accessible space where people don't have to feel like, hey, let me tell you that I'm doing this. So I need more, you know, uh, 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 provisions because if you focus on universal accessibility and inclusion for the 100%, you know, uh, uh, um, then I think people will feel safe. Uh, I just want to nuance here that for some people, disclosure is a life or death issue. You know, for some people, it is so harmful that it can harm their careers, it can, it can harm the opportunities that they get. Uh, and, you know, imagine being somebody from the queer community, and of course, simplifying here, like Chi and uh, Hannah, uh, uh, with the terms, uh, well, with the terminology, uh, if you're from the community and you have all this, you know, compounding identities that Chi, Hannah, and myself have nuanced today, and then coupled with, you know, mental health and, you know, like a toxic workplace, like, can you imagine how rough that has to be? Uh, um, so, yes, yeah, just understanding and also respecting people's agency to disclose what they want and also for companies creating a safe space where they don't have to and taking responsibility in ensuring that their yeah, workspaces are universally accessible and then people can share what they want or what they do not want. Thank you Chisholm and and of course safety is such an important uh, <laughs> Uh, important thing here, and and she already already mentioned it, and and um, so my last question in this in this section where I am uh, uh, asking the question is for all of you: How can companies, individuals, and colleagues create a safe environment for people of all sexualities and gender identities to reveal as much or as little as they want? I will, I will start, since I always start with Hannah, I'm going to start with Chi. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm going to go uh, straight to the uh, part where it's policy and strategy, as well as physical spaces, architectural spaces, built spaces, which defines so many things, right? Policy and strategy is how do we educate our staff to um, acknowledge that if our body necessitates the need, why is it not provided for in its built environment? So my body necessitates that I need to use the bathroom. We all do. Why is this bathroom not safe for me? Why is there a potential for violence for me? I think that should be thought about in terms of our policy and strategies as a company. And furthermore, how do we start implementing conversation that's about um, forbearance and kindness and generosity towards mistakes so that we can develop a better habits of addressing each other appropriately and adequately with the pronouns starting with, right? And not just get angry the minute like someone misgenders you or, and the other person say, don't correct me. And it's, either way, it doesn't help anyone. 
right? The person saying, don't correct me, and the person that's making the correction. It doesn't help when there's just two angry people yelling at each other and not hearing. And I think that's something that are um, that we need to talk about. And I don't, and it goes back to what she was saying. If leadership can demonstrate that generosity and kindness as we move to develop these habits, then the rest of the structure in the system will then accompany it because then we'll learn to forgive the mistakes. And just and so safe space is created by not just when that person's there and you're like, oh, I did it, I did it. No, you don't get a gold star because you did it when they're there. You say their name, you say them in the appropriate gender representation that they wish to be addressed in because they may not be present all the time. Like if I'm not present on the job site and it's male dominated and you misgender me, just don't do that because it gives other people the permission to behave inappropriately with me. And so that then creates a space that's not safe for me. So I think that's also really important to put forth in terms of like how companies and individuals and colleagues can participate. And also, I just want to just put forth this last thing is um, for anyone who works in a space that has stress codes, and I recently did this because I was participating in a event where there was a dress code for that particular space. And that space had dress codes that were gender normative. I immediately contacted their HR and told them that I cannot abide by your gender normative dress code. I don't identify that way. And they invited me to rewrite their policy because they realized that they need to be inclusive. And that's the agency that we have when we feel discomforted. The, the results may not always be that um, positive, but it has not really taken anything more from me than to make that phone call, to reach out, to let them know that you have made me feel uncomfortable to participate and exist in your space, even though you've invited me. How can we mitigate that? And I think that was an important step to know from them as me that we can have a dialogue and that exchange to happen. Thank you, Chi. Uh, Chisel, can you add your thoughts? Yes. Um, ooh. Okay. Uh, uh, from a workplace perspective, I think think about uh, 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 inclusion uh, of all people, and also especially with people within the LGBTQIA uh, 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 community, because I think oftentimes when we say all people, people just see men and women. So it's really important that you <laughs> see the others uh, outside of the binary. Um, uh, 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 think about it from a systemic design perspective, systemic design mandates that we consider the whole as opposed to like small Costs. Yeah. Uh, so think about it the same way you will address any big project that is going to bring you $3 million knock or $30 billion, whatever it is. Think about it from a strategic perspective where literally every step is planned. Uh, um, do it intentionally. You know, don't hope that, oh, I, I hope they will like it. Mm -mm. No, do it intentionally. Don't make assumptions, ask questions, and be clear about what uh, 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 your intentions are. I think take a stand. Uh, uh, you know, like the worst type of companies or people are the ones who are like just like juggling somewhere in between because they want to make everybody happy. No, you can't make everybody happy. Take a stand and stand firmly in that stand. So if you want to be a homophobe and an exclusionary person, own that. But don't be in the middle because you're afraid of something you lose. Take a stand. Um, something else I'd like to say about, say for example, pronouns is we all make mistakes. Our brains are programmed to miss gender people in a sense. And if you find yourself when you're just getting into pronouns, and sometimes I even make mistakes, but the minute you make a mistake, you know. So correct yourself immediately, right? And clarify that, yeah, I made a mistake. I'm so sorry about that. I meant this. Don't pretend like you didn't say it. Don't pretend like that person did not hear you misgender them. Don't pretend like other people were not there. Just own up to it. Apologize, change, 
use the right pronouns and move on. And the thing about pronouns where people are like, oh my gosh, there's so many pronouns, what can I say? And I'm making all these faces because I hear these conversations and you know what, like sometimes it's just frustrating to hear it. But people, people complain oftentimes about uh, uh, having to use pronouns. Now imagine if I tell somebody my name is Chisom and they're like, no, I, I, will, I will call you Ben because you look like a Ben. I will call you Stacy because you look like a Stacy. I mean, it's an oversimplification, but call people, address people as they want to be addressed, right? It doesn't take much from you. And if you do make mistakes because our brains are programmed the way it is, like I said, I make mistakes all the time, correct yourself and move on. And I think the last thing I do want to say is that understand from an individual and uh, a workplace perspective that proximity is not the same thing as lived experience. You know, it's so easy for us to say, yeah, you know, my gay friend, I, I have one of my best friends is gay. And I, I have in the past, you know, even said, yeah, you know, according to my best friend, mm -mm, that doesn't give me agency into his experience. That doesn't give me agency into the community. However, I can be an ally, but just understand that your something something does not give you the 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 was it called that does not give you the lived experience so you should also respect that and when you know somebody from the community shares something with you consider it an a, a learning uh, a opportunity even when it makes you uncomfortable thank you chisong hannah both of you i do <laughs> and i was also going to say that like um she was mentioning laziness earlier and she was now also like talking through this uh using the pronouns the right way uh i heard a, a transgender person uh say once that okay well i don't really feel sorry for you if you can't use my pronoun the right way your intention is what's most important and then if you're like hiding behind the excuse of, ah, oh, I just don't get it. I'm just going to call you the wrong pronoun. Then go home, talk about me, talk about me for hours and practice because then you will have to use the right pronoun until you get it. And it's, that's also what it's all about, right? Like habits. Um, and I think another habit that's that you also have to practice is to when you talk about different minority groups, your workplace um practice saying those of us who are this and that instead of saying the people that are gay over there they are this and that because if we are a whole workplace then you can be more inclusive by saying that those of us who identify as transgender those of us who blah 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 I think that's also a very easy thing to do if you just um, practice. And I think that uh, the most important part, the most important thing to me when working on with diversity in general, but also when it comes to the queer community, be humble, be respectful to what you don't know. Um, and I also think that both if you're within the queer community or outside of it, um read sometimes read the comments on the articles in social media learn about what the criticism is the discrimination what is it all about for the different groups as well i have to take responsibility and read about what transgender people are facing in social media to understand the voices out there and then i just realized this brilliant idea which is that uh a lot of queer people are very well spoken, both queer people and allies, of course. So when you read the comments, also read the comments back, because that's arguments for free that you can use in your allyship within the community and outside the community. So this is all about practice and read. Don't just be curious, just read. Oh. Thank you, Hannah. This is fantastic. <laughs> okay, um, so 
I will I will quickly move on because we've already uh, taken nine minutes out of the, the section for uh, audience question, but I thought that this last question about the, the, the safe environments and, and how can we uh, also provide and, and be allies in making uh, safe spaces was so, so important. So I just wanted that to, to kind of organically come to an end. Um, so we are uh, continue with the questions from from our uh, uh, audience. So, if you have any questions, this is uh, this is also the time to to put it in the chat or any kind of comments. Um, please share it with us. We really want to hear from you. So, I'm going to start with a question with question from Nikki. So, I would love to know more about curiosity. We are encouraged to do this a lot. What does it mean to be curious? Who would like to contribute to that? It wasn't directed to any of you specifically. Oh. I guess Mike. My... You go first. <laughs> you go first. I guess my question is how are we how are we um, defining curiosity? Defining curiosity as in do we participate or curiosity in terms of wanting to learn and uh, and gain the knowledge of. I think that's where I'm trying to. I think that was that was the question. I think it wasn't like generally what curiosity is, but curiosity in like asking questions and how do we learn. Um, I think it goes back to what Hannah is saying, and I and I totally um agree. And that's let's start reading. Why are we banning books and why are we burning books? I don't care if you agree with the book or you don't agree with the book, read it. It may help to see the difference in perspective. It's a discourse, it's a dialogue. We can't, it will be really boring if everyone agreed with me, you know? And I don't want everyone to agree with me. I wanna know your opinion. I wanna know your perspective. And that's, that's part of being curious, right? Part of being curious is like, how do these people live? Are they the same as me? Are they, I am in a relationship. Is my relationship that different than a straight person's relationship? I think the curiosity is to break the idea that, oh my God, there's some, like Hannah said, they're the other. I'm sitting here right next to you. There's no other like geopolitical, geographic space. I'm right here. Let's have this conversation. So I think that curiosity comes from reading and wanting to know more, not just simply about being LGBTQIA, but just about another human being. Let's start from there as our foundation and let's start reading because we need the knowledge. We also need to pass on that knowledge. And we don't always have to agree because we share different lived experiences, but we can always at least be, have a conversation, have a dialogue and exchange those ideas, exchange those perspectives so we can continue to grow and hopefully for the better. Thank you, Chi. Hannah, do you still want to contribute? Yes. Yes. Do? Okay, so I think just briefly, there's a difference. To me, curiosity um, can be like a good kind and a bad kind. And the good kind is the one that actually intentionally wants to learn more and increase their knowledge. That's okay. But then you have the curiosity that stems from the, I have the right to know what you do in bed, for example. or Who's really the guy in your relationship? Um, you know, questions like that. And I think a very good test, and this is really basic, but it's still really important to remember that ask, like before you jump into asking all these questions, ask yourself, how would you react if someone told you, let me have sex with you and I'll turn you right around, you know? Uh, just hear, try and hear the question inside of your head before letting it out. And then you would probably see the difference between I have the right to know or I have the right to comment on your, um, on you, instead of I really want to learn. Can you tell me why is this or this? Yeah. If I could add to that, I, I, I just want to say that the good kind of curiosity uh, also requires humility. Uh, um, it's you might hear something, you might hear that you have enabled a system and structure that does not represent your conscious belief. Uh, um, yeah, I think you need to be humble. You need to swallow that pill, and you need to be there to learn. 
And then when somebody takes the time to teach you or to explain something to you, no matter how difficult or comfortable it is for you, be thankful, right? Because it was not, it's often not easy for say people in any type of community to have to over and over again, <laughs> explain and teach and explain and teach. So be humble that that will go a long way. Thank you, all three of you. Um, okay, next question is from Essia and it is directed to Hannah. Uh, what measures were taken to target the different marginalized groups? Uh, and I think this was a question that, that she, she, is, she says, for example, for this event that was changed to become more inclusive. So this is what she was uh, referring to. Okay, so would it, like, do I understand it correctly? If it's um, how do we get people to attend anyway? How to include other groups and, and like, yeah, we were very particular measures. Yeah, we were very particular on the text written, defining properly. So we, it was uh, the title was changed from Women's Night to just Friday. And then the, the description was very, very thought through, uh, describing that this is for all women. And that means both cis and transgendered women and, and non-binary people. And that this is a safe space. We, we kind of like had, it's not that normal in a Facebook event, but we had like, these are the rules. Um, and I also think we had like a closed attending list so that you couldn't see I guess we, we did that on a lot of events during Pride so that people can actually put themselves on attending without anyone else seeing that they are attending because they might not even be out um, openly. Um, yeah, and I also think that it helped us a little bit that also Pride had the same year, just a few months before, changed the name as well. So this was like a moving trend in a way, or not a trend, but a very important change that happened in, in several prides. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. Essia, I hope you are satisfied with the question. Um, okay, so, uh, so the next question is from Diana, and it's also to Hannah. Uh, and maybe I think we've already uh, uh, kind of uh, touched upon this question, but let's see, maybe Hannah, you have something to add. Uh, so Diana is asking, uh, what measures should be taken in the workplace to target and include minority groups? Yeah, we, we've, uh, we've talked about that, right? I think we have, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Eva, you're mute. Thank you. <laughs> okay, this is a question from Nikki and it's directed to Chi. Uh, what do you see as the catalyst for change in the younger generation? How can this change be strengthened, strengthened and amplified? Um, I think because there's more access to information and that is not to say that may, that's necessarily a good thing because we know that there's information that's circulating and sometimes it's not always the most um, informative, you know, no pun intended. But um, I think the, it's because there's a desire to be heard and to be seen. And I think there's a greater sense of um, identity for the younger generation where they don't feel like they need to be absorbed into this monolith of quote unquote Western society. And so I think that that sort of is the catalyst that the, the feeling of having to, and the need to define oneself within the younger generation, not just so that they can be seen and heard per se, but also understanding how they relate to the rest of the world. And having that information has sort of compelled them to feel more comfortable with themselves, which is very different than previous generations where we were more discreet per se. And this is not to say it's like dramatically improved, but these are the catalysts that sort of helped propel the changes, which is, access to information, visibility, where um, there is more representation, not always the best representation, but there is more. And um, 
and on top of that is also um, to strengthen to amplify is to is to encourage it to happen, right? So, for instance, when um, when I was going to these different pride events and noticing that um, people of color are coming together instead of competing with one another, it's because they're starting to see each other differently. They're starting to understand the information they have been receiving differently. They're exercising a different sense of critical thinking about how they see each other and how they see themselves. And they're starting to also become, um, I don't know if the appropriate would be disenchanted, but they're no longer simply saying or agreeing to what they're being told by the majority. And having that as their basis, they're like, it's okay for me to be with a black man. It's okay for me to be with a brown man. I don't have to just only be with a white man to fit in. And I think that has given the younger generation a lot more um, sense of self and self-love so that I think that we can amplify that by encouraging that. And I think that's really important to say like, it's okay, you don't, we can be in solidarity without having to quote unquote trade up. Thank you, Ching. Um, next question is again from Essia. Uh, so this is directed to Chiso. And uh, what about her space that is a diverse and inclusive community where women can work, belong and thrive, quote, in quotes, um, can we have included women, non-binary, genderqueer, and trans people? Um, thank you for that question. So for those who don't know, Her Space is uh, uh, one of the companies uh, I founded. It's a passion project that now has a life of its own, and it's a co-working and co-creation space for women, uh, mothers, and it's the community is open to everyone in all gender. Um, I founded her space at a time when I just had my daughter, uh, COVID started, and I was feeling incredibly uh, uh, um, huh, isolated. Uh, I didn't have my family with me. I didn't have my sisters with me. I was a new mom. I was very insecure. Uh, and I was also a working mom because yeah, I own three businesses. So I needed a space, but I never really found the space that was inclusive of me. Uh, a lot of spaces were great, but they did not center my experience as a woman. So I wanted to create a space that centered my experience as a woman, that I could come in and have, and also as a mother, that I could come in and have a space where my baby could play or that my baby could cry or I could cry and have a bad day. And I just didn't have to care about what everybody else was thinking. Uh, I created a space where I could change my baby on uh, an actual changing table and not have to do it on the floor of the dirty toilets like I always have. So this was what I had intended and this is what her space had become. Um, so to answer your question, I think I also put up the website. It says her space is a diverse and inclusive community where women can work, belong, and thrive. Our community membership is exclusive to women, women-led companies, and mothers. Our community membership is open to all genders. If you look on the next side, it says our mission is to create a diverse and inclusive world where self-identifying women. So coming back to your question, to me, I think trans women are women. So I think sometimes it's, oh, and, and, and of course, yeah, people feel differently about this if they want to do an identity first, uh, 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 um, uh, 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 ways of seeing themselves or a person first way of seeing themselves. Some people, for some people, it's important to be uh, 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 a trans woman. For others, they just are women. And so we had this conversation as well in our workplace. So for Ross, if you identify yourself as a woman, you are a woman. I don't, I, it's not me, it's not my place to say, oh, but you're a trans woman or you're this, because in some way that also excludes people. Uh, this is also why within our mission, we clarified that it was self-identifying women, just in case there was any confusion. And also within our community, we didn't have to list out all the different genders. We just said it is inclusive of all genders. And I think it's also okay that, you know, this uh, uh, to, 
focus on a group of people if you feel that there is a gap that needs to be filled. So for women, for example, in business, in entrepreneurship, in investments, oftentimes they don't get the same access, right? So one of the things we do at Herspace is also ensure that women get the help that they need, the self-development that they need, and the spaces that they need. And also just to clarify that in some sense, this also reminded me of, you know, the conversation about like Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matters. You know, it's not saying by centering women, all type of women, it's not saying that, you know, every other person or gender queer people don't matter. They, they, they absolutely, they matter. And this is why we say our community is open to all of them. But in focusing specifically on women, and women-led companies. So that also means that you can have a man in your company. You can have a gender poor person in your company, but you have to identify as a woman. That matters to me as well. And that is what her space is created for. So I hope that clarifies your question. Thank you, Chisholm and Essia. I hope that that answers your question. I think that was a very good uh, answer. Thank you. Um, so let's go to the next question. We have five more minutes uh, until three. So uh, let's see what, um, this is a question to everyone from Sayanthony. And she said, she's asking how can companies hire and retain more people from the LGBTQIA plus community? Who would like to contribute to this? I'm just going to offer a very short answer, and that is, um, let's make sure our policies um, include them, and that and that there is equity and pay parity, and that they're just not brought in to meet some algorithm for your company to appear as if though it's diverse and inclusive. We are not part of your numbers game. We are actually here to contribute and value their contribution. And so when I say policy is. Do you provide adequate health care for their needs? Do you, and their needs are specific and not one person is gonna be the same, even if they're all part of that community. So I think just in terms of how we retain, and I know that from um, prior to gay marriage, I'm gonna use this as an example of how we can retain. Prior to gay marriage, um, healthcare did not include partners. And so, but since gay marriage, now they include partnership uh, health benefits but you have to be married. You cannot be civil union. You cannot be domestic partners, which then is still not inclusive because if this person identifies as the partner, why does it apply to a heteronormative couple where they don't necessarily have to be married, but they have to be married in order to benefit from those healthcare system if they're gay. And I think that's already an equity. And so I would preface that with saying like, it goes back to policy and how do we include people in your policy? Thank you, Chi. Um, Hannah or Chisum, do you want to add to that? I can add just a little, um, just one thought, and that's, uh, I'm, I think just be aware as a company if you want to attract queer uh, people to work at your place. I totally agree on what she was saying. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with you, what you said. Um, but my point was that uh, people see right through it if you're not genuine. And especially people of the community that you're trying to attract. So um, be, like, be very aware of that and you do your job properly. Hmm. Thank you, Hannah. Okay, uh, Chizom, did you, okay. Okay, let's see. I think we are left uh, with one last question, and I think uh, uh, we can we'll be wrapping up in time. So Lynn is asking you, Hannah, what is the name of your podcast? <laughs> okay, so my podcast is uh, unfortunately in Norwegian, but the name is Ta Vare med Hanna och Oscar, uh, which means take care with uh, Hannah and Oscar, which is my uh, co-program host. Hannah, yeah. can you write it in on the chat, please? Yes, I can. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, a lot of people here uh, know Norwegian. Yeah. 
uh, and and for the people who are learning Norwegian, I think it's a great way to to practice it and learn it and learn the terminology and learn the words and yeah, it's it's great. <laughs> okay, so it's Tavare. Uh, um, yeah, and it now. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> We still have uh, a couple more questions, but unfortunately, I'm sorry, Asia, I'm sorry, Lynn. Uh, we will not be able to answer your questions uh, this time, but I'm sure that you can find Chi and Hannah on, on LinkedIn. You can connect to them. You can um, uh, continue the conversation. <laughs> yes, Chisum, you want to say something? I think Chi is on LinkedIn. Uh, but oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, we, we can always, you know, try to get answers from uh, them and, you know, send mm -hmm. in an email. Yes, I, I do apologize. I'm sort of analog, so I don't have social media yet. But um, as I'm slowly moving into this realm of developing more DI programs, I am building up social media. So to be, uh, tune in. Okay. My mistake for, for thinking that now everybody's on LinkedIn. <laughs> no <laughs> apologies I, necessary. No apologies necessary. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chi, because uh, like living in Norway, LinkedIn is one of the most important uh, uh, platform if you want to have any kind of professional conversation with anyone. So, um, okay, it's three. Thank you so much uh, uh, to our panelists, to Hannah, to Chi. Thank you, Chi, for, for waking up so early um, <laughs> to be on our panel. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Chisum, as always, for, for contributing to, to the panel and to the conversation. And all three of you, we really appreciate it. And I'm sure that the audience appreciate it. And I really thank everyone who, who joined us, uh, who listened to this conversation. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for any kind of engagement. I hope all of you learned a lot and got a lot of information. We always share a lot of information on this uh, panel discussion. So I hope that people have like uh, a pens and notebook to, to take notes. Um, yes, so this is a Pride Month. So there are probably a lot of events. I know in, in Oslo, there are a lot of events. Uh, so go to oslopride.no to see what's going on. Uh, on Saturday is a Pride Parade. So join us, join us there. Um, and of course, wherever you wherever you're from, uh, 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 get information and, and uh, participate in the celebration.